Heavenly Father, we thank you for yet another opportunity to celebrate the birth of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. May this act of worship serve to show our gratitude and honor your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The intro hymn 77.
the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have poured upon us the new light of your incarnate word. Grant that this light, enkindled in our hearts, may shine forth in our lives through Jesus Christ, O oh Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Our help is in the name of the Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who has on this night caused your only begotten Son to be born of the blessed and glorious ever Virgin Mary for our salvation. But safe, we beseech you, so to hallow and bless this crib, wherein are shown forth the wonders of that sacred birth, that all those who, beholding the same, shall ponder and adore the mystery of his holy incarnation, may be filled with your heavenly benediction unto the eternal, through the same Christ, our Lord. Amen. A blessed good evening to everyone and welcome to the celebration of the Holy Eucharist for the Christmas Day. We begin with our opening sentence. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them has the light shone. Blessed be God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Alleluia, Alleluia. Blessed Lord and Father, we have assembled in your name and in fellowship with one another. Enable us by your grace to offer the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, to proclaim and respond to your holy word. Teach us to pray for your world and your church. Grant that we, confessing our sins, may worthily offer to you our souls and bodies as a living sacrifice and eat and drink of your spiritual food in this holy sacrament. Amen. The Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal God, 
This holy night is radiant with the brilliance of your true light. As we have known the revelation of that light on earth, bring us to see the splendor of your heavenly glory through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please sit for the ministry of the word. A reading from the Word of God, written in the ninth chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah, beginning at the second verse. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us, authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the word of the Lord. The appointed Psalm 96. Thank you. 
A reading from the Word of God, written in the letter of Paul to Titus, the second chapter, beginning at the 11th verse. Titus chapter 2, 11 to 14. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, and in the present age, to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly, while we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He it is who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. This is the word of the Lord. The gradual hymn 765. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, the second chapter and beginning at the first verse. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea 
to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there, were with, there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. This is the gospel of Christ. I speak to you in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Some words from the Gospel according to St. Luke, the second chapter, and part of the seventh verse. There was no place for them in the inn. There was no place for them in the inn. One cannot help but reflect on how, no matter how bad a year you may have had, no matter what is going on in your life, somehow when December hits and we start singing the Advent songs and we hear the readings through the liturgical cycle of the year, the, our mood changes and we are shifted to a reflection on the great mystery of the Incarnation, the fact that God became man in the person of Jesus Christ. And though each gospel has its own perspective of how this took place, one thing is very clear in all the gospel accounts, that Jesus came into a world that was not ready to welcome him. Jesus came to a community that did not really want him. When one reflects in St. Matthew's Gospel, from the time he was born, his life was in danger. We're told that Herod the king was so caught up with his own power that when he heard of a king being born in his realm, his first thought was to destroy. Go out and kill every male child two years and under just to make sure we expunge this threat to my power from my realm. Likewise, in St. John's Gospel, St. John said, He came into the world, and the world received him not. He came unto his own, and his own did not receive him. But St. Luke has an extra special perspective because St. Luke, as a gospel in a whole, is written from the perspective of the outsider. Luke, being a Gentile, 
is constantly seeking on how to bring persons who are on the fringes of the community into the center. So it is Luke who tells us about Zacchaeus. It is Luke who tells us about the Good Samaritan. It is Luke who tells us about the prodigal son. That wherever there are persons on the fringes of the community, St. Luke is looking to bring them in. And it should come as no surprise then that St. Luke's account of the birth of Jesus actually depicts him as an outsider. There was no place for them in the inn. If we look at it from the traditional view, we're told that Mary and Joseph journeyed from the town of Nazareth. Now Nazareth within the context of that time had a very dubious reputation. In fact, when we hear St. John's Gospel, when Nathaniel heard that Jesus came from Nazareth, he asked, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good possibly come from there? So Jesus, even before he was born, had a strike against him. And we're told that his family journeyed from Nazareth to the city of David called Bethlehem. Many scholars believe it was a four or five day journey they traveled about 90 miles per day, eight hours a day, living on just bread and water, and just for a little garnish, some olive oil on the bread every now and again. That is what Mary and Joseph would have had as they journeyed to Bethlehem, only to reach there to find that there was no suitable accommodation for them. The traditional view is that Bethlehem was bustling with tourists at that time. Tourism was booming because there was a census. And so all the inns were filled and there was no place for this young family in the inn. That is the traditional view. And so they were offered a stable somewhere to have their child. But there's an alternative view. And the alternative view lies in the fact that Joseph was actually going home he was from Bethlehem. So if he was going home, he was not expected to stay in a guest house or an inn. He was expected to stay with family. And from as long ago as the 16th century, scholars have been questioning whether Jesus was really born in a, a lowly stable far away from people or whether he was born in a house with family. And that comes because the, the Greek word for in that we find in St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, is fataluma. And fataluma really means the lower level of a house. If they wanted to use the word for a guest house as it was, they would have used pandagoikion, which means a guest house but they use fataluma, which means that Jesus, Mary and Joseph were really staying with family. And when they got to the family house, there was no place for them in the inn. The inn was supposed to be the reception area of the house, the place where people, you know in Barbados we say the front house? And you know how the front house is treated around Christmas time, right? Everybody has the chairs covered and the front house is just there to be looked at, but nobody goes there. That's just what I heard. But there was no place for him there. And so they had to go to the lower level of the house where the animals were. And it is there that Jesus was born. I've highlighted that, my brothers and sisters, to say that Jesus really came to his own family and there was no place for them in the upper part of the house. They had to go downstairs. There was no room for them in the inn. And why was this so? Could it be that Mary and Joseph were seen as outsiders by their own family? Could it be that even before Jesus was born, he was already labeled an outsider? Let us think of it in realistic terms, in village terms. 
Let us look at the dynamics surrounding our Lord's conception and birth. Mary was betrothed to a man called Joseph. And before he could marry her, before they could have any relations, she was found to be pregnant. In St. Matthew's Gospel, we are told that Joseph wanted to put her away privately. Joseph wanted to cut off the engagement. But an angel said to him, do not be afraid to take Mary, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. It's good for Joseph to hear that. But what was the family really thinking? What was the conversation amongst Joseph's family about the dynamics of his family setting? Think of it in Barbadian terms. You know, there are always conversations going on, right? Even within the household. The little quiet conversations that are going on in the kitchen and so on. Let he go along, let him go down there because he, like, he turned foolish or something. And in Barbados, we call that something else. He bewitch. My brothers and sisters in Christ, there's a message for us all here. There's a message in St. Luke's Christmas story. Because what St. Luke is saying is that the Messiah of this world came to his own family and they could find no room for him in the inn. They placed him downstairs with the animals. The Messiah, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords was born in a trough from which the animals feed. That was the lowly state in which he came into this earth. And St. Luke has really taken us to find the Messiah at the level of the humus, the level of the very basic existence of humanity. That is where we encounter Christ. That is where we are called to find him. I wonder what would have happened if the family knew that he was going to be the Messiah of Israel. Perhaps they would have cleaned out the best room in the house and shaped it up for him. But St. Luke is sending a message to us that the Messiah is found in anyone. In the ordinary person that you encounter in your daily life. In the ordinary person that you may not think much of. That is where the Messiah can be found. So St. Luke is cautioning us about making outsiders of others. St. Luke is cautioning us that when we make outsiders of others, we can miss the very Messiah in our presence. And perhaps the question we are called to reflect upon during this Christmas season is as a community. Who are the outsiders in our community? Who are those people that we just tolerate? Put them downstairs, man. If they're here, put them down. But there's no space in our inner circle for them. Who are those people? Or perhaps even closer home. Who are the outsiders in your family? You know, families have outsiders too. Families have persons that they think, oh, I, I had to try and lend a body. I don't want a body to know that I related to them. You ever heard that? Because I'll tolerate them, but I can't, I, I don't want them in my inner circle. There's no room for them in the inn because they're making me look bad. I can't identify with them. And it was Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, Whenever we find ourselves saying that, check yourself first. Whenever you think that you are too good for other persons to be a part of your circle, look at yourself closely. Because you may well be the problem, not the persons that you do not want. And so who are we just willing to tolerate, but we do not want too near us? That is so opposed to the Christian call. 
It is so opposed to St. Luke's understanding of the Incarnation. For as I said, Luke presents Jesus at the level of the very basic, just the level of humus. He is at the lowest level of his community. He is at the lowest level of his family. But that is where we encounter the Messiah. If we have learned anything from COVID-19, if it has taught us anything, I hope it is that we've learned what it means to be isolated. That we've learned what it means to be cut off. And in doing so, we understand how others feel when we say there is no room for them in the inn. We understand how others feel when we push them to the fringes of our society and say, we will tolerate you, but you can't be in the center here. We don't want persons to really know that we know you. I hope we have felt what that feels like just by the isolation that we've experienced during this COVID-19 period. It is how we make others feel when we treat them as outsiders, when we determine that there's no space for them in our inn. And the inn here is not a literal place. I'm just speaking metaphorically. When there's no space for them in our lives, when we have no time for them, when we do not want to be identified with them. I believe that St. Luke is encouraging us this Christmas. For we have all had harrowing experiences throughout the course of the last year and a half. And perhaps St. Luke is telling us, let us take that journey with Mary and Joseph again. Let us journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Let us go through the rigors that they experienced, as some of us have gone through during the course of the past year and a half. Some of us have had the anxiety of seeing our finances dwindle, our work taken away from us by the pandemic, our ability to survive and provide for our families drastically compromised. Mary and Joseph on their journey to Jerusalem, on to Bethlehem, felt that living on bread and water, just trying to survive the desert heat. Sometimes there were robbers along the way. They also had to fight those. We have faced some of those things as well. Take that journey. Feel what Mary and Joseph felt when they got to the place where they were going to family. They were going to stay amongst family but there was no space for them in the inner circle. Put them downstairs. Put them down there with the animals. Imagine this scared, pregnant teenager placed in the lower level of a house with the animals. Imagine what she would have gone through, perhaps feeling the coldness of in-laws who thought, mm, so I hope Joseph knows what he's up to. I hope he knows what he's doing. That is how we make others feel sometimes. It was Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his work, Living in Community, who said, what is an unspeakable gift for the lonely individual is easily disregarded and trodden on the foot by those who have the gift every day. Think about those people who are lonely. Think about those people whom society has said, you cannot be any better. We don't want you as a part of the center. Think of the pain they go through every day. And remember how our Lord came to this earth according to St. Luke. He was one of those people. He was out there. 
I believe that the best gift we can give this year is the gift of letting people in, creating a little space in the inn for them, creating a little space in our lives so that they can feel valued, so that they know and understand that they are children of God and they, they are worthy of love and care and compassion. Jesus will exemplify this throughout his whole life, even though he was rejected at the start. He came and showed us what our living should really be like as he embraced all people from all walks of life, people that nobody wanted to be around. He faced ridicule because of the people he interacted with. We are told that when he went to the house of the Pharisee in the same St. Luke's Gospel, and the woman of the city came and wet his feet with her tears and dried them with her hair, the Pharisees were saying, this man, he can't be a prophet. If he was, he, he's, he's lying with the riffraff. If he was a prophet, he would know what kind of woman was touching him. Likewise, based on the accusations that he faced, for Jesus had to say in St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 7 and verse 31 and following, with what will I compare the people of this generation and what are they like? For John the Baptist came eating no bread and drinking no wine. You said he had a demon. I have come eating and drinking. And they say, behold, a glutton and a drunkard, the friend of tax collectors and sinners. See, because Jesus was not about leaving anyone on the outside. He saw value in every single human being. And that is all we are called to do as his children. In fact, it was the writer of the letter to the Hebrews in chapter 13 and verse 2 who said, Remember to show hospitality to strangers, for in so doing some have entertained angels unawares. Jesus' family and his community missed the Messiah, missed him totally, simply because his parents were from Nazareth with that dubious reputation simply because the circumstances surrounding his conception were not clear to everyone in this community put them in the lower level leave them down there how often do we do that how many times have we pushed people to that lower level how many times have we said there's no room for them in the inn but I challenge us I challenge us to see the Messiah in every single human being we interact with. There's an old Jewish saying that if you would assume, if you would just assume that the person sitting next to you is the Messiah, waiting for some kindness and compassion, you'll soon learn to weigh your words and watch your hands. And even if he does not reveal himself in your time, at least you would have done something good. And that is all we're called to do, you know. See Christ in everyone. In fact, he told us that is ultimately how you'll be judged. You may not be judged by how loftily you, you, you expounded things. You may not, you'll not be judged by how great your voice was in church or not even how many times you were marked present. You know what you'll be judged by? By how you saw your fellow human beings. When I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was naked, you put clothes on me. When I was sick, you took care of me. When I was in prison, you actually took time out to visit me. When I was a stranger and nobody wanted to talk to me, you embraced me and made me feel like somebody. And we're told that many will say, but Lord, when did we see you like this and did these things for you? And he'll say, and as much as you have done it to the least of one of these, your brothers or sisters, you have done it to me. That is the message of the incarnation. That is what Christ came to teach humanity. And in St. Luke's Gospel, as in all the other Gospels, he was an outsider. And he came at the lowest level so to show us all that no matter where we are in this life or where we think people are, 
the Messiah is within all people. And so as we observe this Christmas season, this Christmas season that for some may well be a hard candy Christmas, in spite of all the hustle and bustle we have seen in the last few days, I appeal to us as a community that the greatest gift we can give this year, not the tangible things, but the gift of just letting someone know that we love you, that you have a space in the inn. I appeal to you as family as well. If there's any family member that has been estranged from the family, give them a call. Reach out to them. And no matter what they've done, no matter where they are, or who we may think they are at this point in time. They are God's children. Embrace them. Do not leave them in the cellar. Make some space in the inn for them so that we can all share in that space and share each other's company and reflect the love of God that can be found in family and community. There was no space for them in the inn. Let us ensure that there's always space for someone else. Let us ensure that no one is left outside on the fringes, but all are brought in and are all are encouraged to recognize the value that they have as children of God. I pray that Almighty God will guide us all during this Christmas season, as we reflect on how our Lord came into this world, that we will ensure that all people have a space in our circle and all are valued and loved and cherished by us. Amen. Let us now confess our beliefs in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen or unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made one in being with the Father. Through him all things were made for us and for us salvation. He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Intercession Form B. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for all bishops, 
priests and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us pray for our needs and those of others. Almighty God, to whom our needs are known before we ask, help us to ask only what accords to your will, and the good things which dared not uh, or in our blindness cannot ask, grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Act of Penitence if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us therefore confess our sins. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and one another in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have left undone. We are sorry and repent of all our sins. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, sake. May Almighty God have mercy upon you pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ, O Lord. Amen. We are the body of Christ. By the one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, and have all been made to drink of the one Spirit. Let us then pursue the things that make for peace, and build up the common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us share that peace. God's peace. Kindly be seated. The choir will now render the anthem entitled In the Bleak Midwinter.
They offer Terry him 60.
the presentation of the offerings. Father, we offer you these gifts which you have given us, this bread, this wine, this money. With them we offer ourselves, our lives, and our work to become, through your Holy Spirit, a reasonable, holy, and lively sacrifice. As this bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ, so may we and all your people become channels of your love. To the same Christ, O oh Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Father Almighty, everlasting God. Because you gave Jesus Christ your only Son to be born for us, who by the mighty power of the Holy Spirit was made perfect, man of the flesh of the Virgin Mary, his mother, so that we might be delivered from the bondage of sin and receive power to become your children. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Eucharistic Rite E. Sovereign Lord and Father, to you be glory and praise forever. In your boundless wisdom, you brought creation into being. In your great love, you fashioned us in your image. In your tender compassion, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, to share our human nature. In the power of the Holy Spirit, he overcame the power of sin and death and brought your people to new birth as first fruits of your new creation. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take this and eat it. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, According to the command of your dearly beloved Son, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer you, Father, our sacrifice of thanks and praise. Send your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine, 
that they may become the body and blood of your Son, Jesus, our Lord and Redeemer. As we partake of this holy food of new and unending life, may your Holy Spirit establish us as a royal priesthood with the blessed Virgin Mary, St. George and all your sons and daughters who share in your eternal inheritance. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. With him and in him and through him, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father Almighty, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honor and glory and power be yours forever and ever. Amen. As our Savior has taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. The gifts of God for the people of God. Our souls will peace and be satisfied. And we will sing glad songs of praise to you.
the First Communion Hymn 81.
number 68. <laughs> Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, the honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Christ, 
who by his incarnation gathered into one all things earthly and heavenly, fill you with his joy and peace, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Good morning, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I take this opportunity on behalf of my family, both nuclear and extended. My mother and sisters and their spouses are here and their children are here and friends. Along with the parochial church council and the entire congregation of St. George Parish Church, I wish you a happy and blessed Christmas 2021. It has been a rough year. But we give thanks to Almighty God that we're able to gather in this place, in this way, to offer praise and thanks to him for the mystery of the Incarnation. There are still many throughout the world who have not been able to meet for probably over a year. And so we consider it a privilege to be able to do this. And let us not take these things for granted, but glorify God in, the, in every opportunity he gives us. It is customary at this time of year for me to read the message from His Lordship, the Bishop of Barbados. However, we are in an age of technology, and so I'll have the Bishop speak to you himself rather than have me read his message. And so I now invite you to hear the message from His Lordship, the Bishop, Michael Maxwell. Dear family of God, I greet you with the love, joy, peace, and hope of Christmas as we begin this season to commemorate and celebrate the nativity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Despite all that continues to unfold around us and affect us in our troubled world today, particularly that of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and its ripple effects, we as Christians continue to observe and joyously celebrate Christmas because of the good news such an occasion always has to offer for all phases and stages of life. This Christmas season reminds us and reinforces that the God we serve is not a creator who has simply formed us out of the dust, placed us in this world, and left us to navigate our lives without his divine company and assistance, but rather that he is one who, because of his endless love for us, is ever mindful of us and deeply concerned about our well-being. It is because of that great love that he came to be one with us that we may be at one with him in the person of his son Jesus Christ on that first Christmas morn. On that morn, Jesus was born in a messy stable, in circumstances that were certainly symbolic of the unstable and troubled world into which he came. Jesus entered at a time very similar to ours at present, when there were persons isolated from mainstream society due to incurable diseases or mental and spiritual illnesses, when there was great disparity between the wealthy and the needy, the practice of idolatry and the level of immorality was on the rise, and political oppression and greed were the order of the day under the Roman Empire. It was into such a world that Jesus was born in that messy stable to be God's anointed one and to offer guidance, deliverance, transformation, peace and hope, that confident expectation of a good future so long as we rest our lives in him. In fact, Jesus came to reveal that this is the true and loving and liberating nature of our God who desires and will give of his best to change our circumstances in life for the better but it is for us to receive God's Christmas gift and desire that change in our lives as well. One of the primary reasons we therefore celebrate this season 
is because of the love of God demonstrated in sending his son not to condemn or destroy the world for its waywardness, but to offer us the opportunity to reset our lives, to be regenerated or reborn to a newness of life. He has provided the means for us to realign ourselves with our created purpose, because for some time, this world has been malfunctioning due to human error. It is therefore, my friends, incumbent upon us as Christians to celebrate this season even at this time, when our world appears to be in disarray, when hope seems to be waning, or in some instances, lost, because we have the confidence that our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He continues to be here with and for us, to strengthen, guide, support, and deliver us. As he works through his Son Jesus Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit within us for the resetting of our lives, our God empowers us to stand strong and to address and overcome the ills of our times and to live in true love for and at peace with him and each other. The word reset, with which we shall become very familiar in the coming year, when used as an acronym, can highlight for us the loving mission of God that commenced on that first Christmas morn as he came in Jesus Christ to R, reach out to us as God with us, E, enlighten us through the word made flesh, S, sanctify us by his sacrificial death, E, empower us through his enabling spirit, and T, transform us through the spiritual renewal of our minds. In Jesus Christ, my friends, God has provided the means of erasing our human errors and granted us a reset of our lives to bring forth peace on earth and love and goodwill to be shared among all peoples. That's the gift of Christmas that we celebrate at this time. I therefore urge us not to lose hope in facing a world currently in turmoil, heightened by the pandemic, climatic, and economic crisis that continue to unfold because we are reminded in this season that God still comes to us, abides with us, our Lord Emmanuel, to freely offer in love the resetting of our lives and our world. May this Christmas season then be one in which we all sincerely, joyously, and graciously celebrate and accept anew God's gift of our incarnate Lord to do his work in our lives. May our hearts be always open to be visited taught, blessed, guided, strengthened and restored by Jesus to a life of righteousness, peace, joy and love. And to be assured that our Creator God offers us once again amidst the challenging times the opportunity also to reset our church and our republic that they both be aligned with His divine purposes. I wish you and those near and dear to you on behalf of my family and myself a blessed and peaceful Christmas season and God's continued favor for the year 2022. I am your friend and your bishop, Michael Barbados.
Lord be with you. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Blessed Christmas to all from my house to yours. Do have a peaceful and joyful day and remember whatever you do, do it safely.